In this video, we're going to cover the first 13 items that every prepper should purchase. Now, these 13 items, they really form the backbone of the bare minimum items that you'd want to have on hand in a disaster situation. Now, if you're not familiar with Dave Canterbury, he teaches the 10 C's of survival. And we're going to modify and we're going to expand his 10 C's to cover the 13 C's to define items that you're going to want to have on hand. Now, additionally, if you were to want to, let's say, put together a simple kit for maybe a family member who's not a prepper, but you want to make sure that they have the absolute basics of what they need, this might be a great starting point. In this video idea came from a recent forum posting in the city prepping community, which I'll post a link to below if you're interested in knowing when we're going to open it up again. And in that discussion, the question came up regarding putting together kind of a covert prepper kit for a family member that's not a prepper. So if you were to put these simple items together in maybe a small bag or tote and you handed it off to them with maybe the explanation of only using it in a severe disaster, I think they're gonna appreciate the gesture. So stick around until the end as we're gonna summarize the most affordable items that you may wanna consider if you're building a bag for a family member who's not a prepper. We'll describe which of these items out of all the items that we're gonna cover are probably the most uh, cost-effective that you'd wanna have. Number one, cover. A cover is anything that provides us with a degree of shelter. We have to think about from the situation of, does that mean water resistance? Does that mean something like a jacket if we're in the cold weather? Something like as simple as a hat that uh, gives us you know, shelter over our head. I mean, as you can tell, uh, I need a lot of shelter on my head. So what we're really discussing here is thinking about from the perspective of if you're exposed to the elements, what items are you gonna to wanna to have on hand? Now, again, I'm presenting a lot of different options to give you ideas. I mean, you can mix and match. Everybody's gonna have different situations. You can just isolate it down to one, but let's go through a few options here. Now, as you can see, I've got a traditional tarp. Now, before I do jump into that, here's my traditional tarp. This is the kind you can get at Walmart for a few dollars. Uh, you can pick it up on Amazon. And again, if I was stuck out in a storm, I'm hiking or something, and this is all I have, well, it keeps me out of the elements. Now, there are more advanced options, such as this one from Soul. This is a company, they do a lot of survival gear. This one has a, a kind of a, a foil or like a reflective side on it, and it enables you to reflect heat back in. It's the same concept. It's a tarp, and as you can see here, let me put that up to the camera. You've got a shelter or kind of a lean-to that you can create, and you can you know take yourself out of the element. So this kind of serves a few different purposes. Again, I mentioned something as simple as a hat. We've got something like a basic poncho. Um, you've got even you know for a few dollars you can pick up uh, something as simple as these mylar blankets. A lot of times what you'll see on the news when they bring people in during emergencies or they'll wrap them up real quick, they'll often use these because it's just a very cheap, quick option that serves a purpose. From the same manufacturer I mentioned ago, Soul, I have no relation with them, but they do provide a lot of, or produce a lot of kind of survival gear specific to different scenarios. They have these bivvies. So I might do a video about sleeping in one of these late at night or rather all night. Uh, I've seen some videos on YouTube where people pull these off. And again, this just provides you with a level of warmth. Again, some kind of shelter around you. Also, something as simple as a bandana. I keep this in a Ziploc bag uh, in my bug out bag so it doesn't get wet if the bag were to get rained on. And again, same concept as I mentioned a second ago, just a basic rain poncho. So out of all these items that we have here, again, the key here is to provide a shelter, a protection from the elements. And again, everybody's gonna have a unique situation. Maybe you live in an area where there's a lot of sun or you get a lot of rain. But overall, think that through, what would you want in a situation if you were exposed in the elements? Number two, cutting. All right, for cutting, we've got uh, about four different options here. Let me run through these very quickly with you. The first is what I would consider something like an EDC knife. And by EDC, we mean everyday carry. These are small knives that you can slip in your pocket and they're just practical and easy to carry on a daily basis. Um, over the years, honestly, this knife right here is a small, just you know, a little blade that uh, pops out. And I've used this one practically for I don't know, so many different situations. But again, you'll find so many different types of options online. They range from different price points. Uh, I believe this one is a Kershaw. And again, it's gotten the job done for me over the years. Now, if you wanna kind of step up in the small blade department, I would look at something like a multi-tool. 
Now, again, they're Swiss Army knives. When I was in Boy Scouts, that's what we use. I recently, all my bags have um, uh, Leatherman knives. I'm not sponsored by them. I just love their kind of multi-tool functionality. You open these up, you've got so many different types of options in here to cover most of the situations that you may need in what we consider some type of emergency situation. This one is their Leatherman. Uh, I believe this one that I've had for a few years is their Titanium. And again, um, there's a lot of different options on the market for this. They've got, you know, as you can imagine, uh, all different types of uh, you know setups based on price and functionality. Now that we've covered our EDC and we've covered our multi-tool, let's look at a fixed blade knife. Fixed blade knife is pretty popular within the preparedness community due to their or versatility. They serve a lot of purposes. Uh, you can use these to process wood. You can use them uh, for so many different things. And what you're looking for is a full tang knife that has the metal that goes all the way through the handle. As you can see on both sides, or rather as I flip this knife around, you'll see that the metal extends here on the spine and on down here on the bottom. Now, some knives, if you look, you'll see something like a rat, uh, rat tail. And what it is, it's instead of that metal extending through the handle, it does, but it's they narrow it down to be very, very small. So whenever I set, uh, rather look for fixed blade knives, I usually go for this full tang option right here. This is Survival Lily's knife that she sells. Um, it's very popular. It's, I've used it for a while, I like it a lot. And again, as you can see here, we've got this metal spine that goes all the way through and here at the bottom as well. So this is something that you can use and uh, for very, um, how should I put it? Very heavy purposes, it's gonna you know hold up. Now, on the lower end of the price range, I forget exactly how much these cost. They used to be under $10. I think they've gone up since then, but still very affordable. Um, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Morkaniv, Morkaniv. I believe it's a Swedish company. But these are very popular, low price, and again, still very useful for your fixed blade options. Now, if we were to come over and look at something for processing firewood, or rather processing wood, cutting branches, stuff like that, uh, you've got so many of these, you know, saws. This is from, I believe, Fiskars. And if you want to really get something of much better quality, um, I chew. I always like the, the big or the um, silky saws. The Canadian Prepper turned me on to these years ago. Uh, I've got a lot of their different options in the garage, and I have used this for years without any issue. Never had a sharpening the blades, and uh, always just keep your fingers out of the way when you're closing these up. These are, uh, you know, uh, pretty sharp. I'll put it that way. But Again, when you're looking at options, you have to consider what your purpose is or what you'll need. And again, you've got everything from something small you can carry on a daily basis to something more advanced that you could actually process wood. And that really summarizes the cutting category. Number three, combustion. Combustion refers to our ability to start a fire. After a disaster, fire can serve many purposes between warming us, uh, providing you with a signal, cooking food, boiling water. And so we want that ability to be able to start a fire. So let's look at a few different options here. We've got a simple ferro rod. Now these are very popular because even if they get wet, you can still create a spark to ignite a fuel source. Uh, now this one right here is called a wet fire. A wet fire, if you were to open this up, it's a small little white, uh, you know, kind of like tablet and you can scrape it off. And with something like our ferro rod, if we were to spark it off, this will start a fire. And if you combine it with some basic kindling, you can get a fire going a lot easier. And that's really the objective. It's kind of a, a booster, so to speak, <clears throat> excuse me, to get you started on getting your fire going. Now, the next one is our old school, traditional Bic lighter. Now I do have a little case here that just protects the top to keep it from accidentally being uh, you know, ignited but I also wrap some duct tape around it. But again, this is one of the more popular options. In the past, whenever I've talked about any type of lighter, um, I've had a lot of people in the comments section, smokers point out, Bic is the way to go. This is the one they always rely on if they really wanna get a fire going versus some of the cheaper ones on the option. Uh, now, of course, you can get something like a small canister or rather just you know something with some uh, essential matches inside. If you go online, there's all types of uh, survival matches that supposedly you know, can uh, be lit in very wet conditions. But again, this little container that I've got it in here uh, protects it and keeps it dry. Uh, I also carry tin foil because if I have to start a fire on a, something like a wet ground and I've got maybe the wet fire and I put it on top of this and a little kindling on top, I just have a better chance of getting things up and running. Now, this is a um, just a basic Fresnel lens. And if you've ever played around with one of these and you put it out in the sun and you put something behind it, you can concentrate the sunlight and you can start 
uh, your fire pretty easily. So this is extremely small. You could probably fit into your credit card or rather your wallet. And again, serves that purpose. And again, just another type of ferro rod option on the market. Uh, again, you can just unscrew this and there's a you know, ferro rod inside that you can spark it off. Now, again, these are ranging from kind of options that will work even when they're wet to you know something like a Bic lighter. And again, if I was in a, uh, I've, I've been in different situations where I've had to start fires in campouts, and my go-to is always, it's hard to beat the uh, Bic lighter because <laughs> when you need the light, it always does light. But again, it's always good to have backup options that in the event, if one of these were to get wet, you can still function. Number four, container. Containers serve the purpose of holding and allowing us to transport water. Say you're out on a hike or you're having to travel somewhere after a disaster and you find a water source, you're able to quickly uh, you know, obtain the water and keep it with you as you go. Now, there's a couple of options here. I've used Nalgene water bottles for years. Uh, they're actually made in the United States, so a uh, little uh, bonus for them on that. But I've, as you, well, probably hard to see here, but this one's pretty scratched up and pretty beat up. And uh, yeah, I've put them through the test and never had one crack or have any issues with it. Uh, now these do have a larger, wider mouth. So if you wanted to uh, do uh, a lot of the filters that I have actually, they'll attach on the end of these like the Ketadin, Ketadin, I always mispronounce that, but their water filter pump system fits on the end of this. And I've just always liked that. Now Clean Canteen, they've got a lot of different options as well. I like these simply, I do keep one of these in our family bug out bags. It's a bit heavier than the Nalgene, not terribly so, but the advantage is if we had to boil water, I can take this you know, plastic off the top, put this into a fire and I can actually boil water. So it serves that purpose of uh, you know, giving you that option. And the last one is a Silcock key. And if you follow the preparedness community for any length of time, this is often discussed, especially when we talk about suburban, urban environments where on the side of buildings, if you've ever come across one of those faucets on the side and they have those, you know, there's no handle to uh, actually knob to open it up, but you'll find usually some kind of a weird, you know, like, uh, you know, little, uh, what am I trying to say? A little insert where you have to put one of these in. It's just different looking, right? And they do that to prevent people from opening up their water. So this is your key to the city in a sense. In a, so in a nutshell, these are some different options. Of course, you can get into things like uh, water bladders, different things like that. But I like these because at the price point and what they can do, they serve a very useful purpose. Number five, cordage. What's the purpose of cordage? After a disaster, there could be a lot of applications where you need the ability to whether secure something down, uh, you need to lash something. Uh, again, uh, just all the different situations that could come up, you would want the ability to secure uh, whatever it is. I, I'll give you an example. We were hiking one time in our scout troop last year, had a gentleman trip, break his wrist, and no one had any kind of a SAM splint or anything like that. Somehow I got left back at camp. So fortunately, someone had some cord with him. So we found a piece of wood to immobilize his arm and wrapped it up with cordage to again, create that, uh, you know, immobilize his broken arm. So whatever the application is, having this on hand can be incredibly useful. And what you're typically gonna look for is what's called 550 paracord. This is probably the most popular within the preparedness community. This is 50 foot length. Uh, I keep this in my wife's bug out bag. I've got what's called survivor cord. It's the same concept, but inside, if you were to unravel this and rather cut off the end and open it up, you've got a lot of tiny cords within that serve a lot of different purposes, uh, whether that's creating a fishing line or different things. So again, I'm not sponsored by them, but I, I do keep this on hand in my own bug out bag. And I believe this is a hundred foot length, but again, cordage gives us that ability to secure whatever it is you need to. Number six, candle. Candle refers to the ability to produce light. Uh, like all these items that we're going to go over, I'll show you several different options. I carry all of these in different bug out bags that we have. Uh, the first one is a headlamp. Now, I like this one simply because wherever you look, you've got a light source. And this one in particular, I can turn on a red light so that if it, I'm you know, out at night and I turn on the red light, I can still see, but I don't lose my nighttime vision. With a white light, you're not going to, you'll lose that essentially. Um, now, as far as your standard handheld flashlight, these can come in, uh, well, they are pretty practical. I was last week on a hunting trip and while some of the individuals in our group had a traditional headlamp, uh, something like this, I, I actually carried this one. It provided us with a lot better ability to see further out. And this is from a company called Olight. 
Several years ago, they sent uh, a lot of their different flashlights. I wouldn't say four or five years ago, and I still to this day use these same ones they sent me. If you look over my shoulder up in the corner, this flashlight that I always have on the background of my videos, it's actually 10,000 lumens, pretty bright. But again, uh, just practical and useful to have in addition to a standard headlamp for being able to see further out. Now this last one is a Kim light. And essentially what you do is you take this out of the package, just it looks like a little, kind of a you know, see-through stick. You can break it, snap it, and it'll light up. Uh, again, a Kim stick, glow light, whatever you want to call it. Very popular, especially if you have children and you want to be able to attach this to them to be able to see where they are. Uh, could be just as equally useful. Number seven, cotton bandana. Bandanas, I think, are one of those overlooked items within the preparedness community. Um, I probably should do a breakout video on this, but think about the different things that you could use this for. Maybe there's a fire outside and you need to have a mask and you didn't bring one and you just want to wet this down and put it over your face. Maybe you get some type of cut somewhere on your body and you want to be able to put this on as a, a bandage. And think about maybe you break a limb and you need to create a sling. Maybe you need to pre-filter water, get most of the dirt out before you use your filter to extend the life of the filter. You could put this over one of our containers that we talked about earlier, pour the water through and it will help remove. I mean, the list could go on and on. And so the point is for something so cheap and easy, you know, it's lightweight and easy to throw into an emergency kit, I think it's something you should definitely consider. Number eight, compass. Let's be honest, we've gotten comfortable and gotten used to being able to turn on our GPS and tells us where to go. But again, this video is designed to get us to think about situations in an emergency situation where electricity may not be available, our cell phone may not be operational, GPS, you can go through the list. But the point is, this is a tried and true backup option and maybe a primary option, depending on your situation, combined with a map, you can quickly navigate with some basic skills. So definitely consider the compass. Number nine, cargo tape. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, but around my house, if you go to different rooms, you'll usually find uh, Gorilla Tape. I've got this stuff everywhere. Uh, your duct tape or different types of tapes that you can get, these really serve a great purpose to secure whatever it is you need to, something's broken. And again, in the context of this video, survivability, emergencies, uh, you may come across a situation where you just need to secure something down, maybe it's broken, and be able to pull it together for just a moment. So consider cargo tape. Number 10, communication. There's a couple of ways to look at communication. We can talk about getting information that we receive, or we can talk about two-way. In the context of this, we're talking about a two-way conversation where we can both receive information and we can send it to individuals that may be outside or inside of the impacted area. Now, within the preparedness community, one of the most popular options is the ham radio. The Baofeng radios, they're very affordable. Some can come in as cheap as about $25, $30. If you get a ham radio license, you're able to communicate and transmit on these devices. I've done a video, if you look in my library for getting a ham radio license, it's a pretty easy process. And again, so many options here. Um, now, these don't have to only be used in that context of ham radio. You can use these as a two-way radio without a license if you go into a different frequency. Uh, speaking of two-way radios, again, the traditional a lot of people have is walkie-talkies. These are a great starting point, not that expensive. And just having in your group, if you're broken up and you get split for whatever reason, having that ability to connect is going to be so vital. Now, the last I often bring up in my videos, and these are very popular, the Garmin InReach. These can actually connect to satellite as long as you have a clear signal to the sky or rather a clear view. And these come in at a very high price range and they have a subscription to be able to use it. But it's something I keep inside of my Jeep and often in my bug out bags, depending on where I'm going. So think about communication. Some of these options, they're not that expensive to start out with. Number 11, canvas needle. Uh, <laughs> this one, if I'm just being completely honest, uh, I've never been in a situation where I thought to myself, I need a canvas needle. But there could be a lot of applications where you need to, uh, again, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, secure something and having the ability to maybe sew something. Uh, these are a much, much thicker canvas needles. These things are pretty thick. And this is not something you would do a suture or rather perform a suture with. Uh, <laughs> if, if you're in a place where that's what you're using it for, uh, good luck. But anyway, if you were to use this, for example, uh, being able to sew up material, uh, having you know this combined with some type of uh, string, it could be very, very useful. And again, at the price point, having something as simple, uh, it's lightweight, easily transportable, it could actually be very useful. Number 12, consumables, aka food. 
When we talk about emergency preparedness and thinking about after disaster, what I often do when it comes to food is I try to avoid foods in kits that don't, you know, that don't require cooking, boiling water, something that I can just pull out and use it very quickly. And again, I always think from the context of, okay, if I can just make it 72 hours, now obviously we'll survive without food for 72 hours. But if you're having to hike or, you know, travel long distances or just enjoy your day in the sense of uh, not being in <laughs> constant state of uh, hunger, I would want to have something like this on hand. Now, there are a lot of different options and I typically recommend uh, things like this SOS survival bar. This has a little over 3,600 calories. You could kind of break this up into three days. You can see there's kind of three big bars in here. And if you had to stretch these out for, you know, again, getting you through, it would at least give you a morale booster, right? And again, if I have to cover distance, I want something that's going to give me some energy and uh, calories. Now, these, a lot of these are designed to last a long time. They usually have an expiration date in excess of four to five years out from the time that you purchase them. So I always, again, look for options that don't require cooking, cleaning, boiling water, something I can just simply uh, open up and consume. Number 13, clean water. You can only go three days without water, more or less. But what would be worse is drinking dirty water after a disaster. If you were to get in contaminants, get sick, some type of a bacteria, and you begin to vomit, have diarrhea, well, your timeline of dehydration is only going to accelerate. As such, we want to be able to process water. Now, I'll show you just a, sub, a couple of quick, simple options here. The first one is a live straw. You've probably seen these before. They're very popular. You just pop the end off here, stick it in a water source, and then you draw the water through here on the other end. Very simple. Don't have to think about it. The other one that I like, and I keep these in most of my bags, is a Sawyer Mini. And essentially, this is the filter itself. And what you do is you can fill this container up with water, squeeze it while this is attached, and then you get water on the other end. Some people put these in line with their um, camel bags and they have a hose coming off. They'll put it in line so they can draw the water through it. And again, at the price point on these, they're not that expensive. And in a survival situation, yeah, the ability to filter water would be crucial. Number 14, cash. I'll throw in a bonus here. This is our 14th C. I said a 13th at the beginning of the video, but I'll throw this as an option. Now, if you're billing a bag for family members of survival kit, maybe you don't throw cash in, but in all of our EDCs or bug out bags, we keep a certain amount of cash, preferably in small denominators. Uh, I usually keep a lot of ones and fives. Why would we want this? Well, after disaster, maybe within the first few days, some stores may still accept cash if their credit card machines are not working. So if you're in a pinch and you need the ability to be able to buy something, you might want to consider cash. So now that we've covered all the different items with the different options, let's summarize what I would say if you're getting a, or giving a kit away to somebody, what would you really want to give them? A lot of these items I keep in a lot of my personal bags, but if I were to set up a basic kit for someone that gives them kind of the core essential items that they would need in a survival situation, here's what I would do. Uh, some type of bandana, a uh, live straw. These are pretty affordable and they're pretty dummy proof. Just stick in the water source and draw out. Some type of simple EDC knife. You can even pick one up at Walmart for four or five bucks. I think a Kim light is very useful. Again, dummy proof, lasts a long time, doesn't require batteries, throw it in a bag, forget it. And it could serve a very useful purpose for many reasons. Some type of long-term survival bar. Again, these are called new millennium energy bars. I have no affiliation with them. It's just uh, after looking at a lot of different options, it was one that stood out to me. Some simple 550 paracord. You can get Gorilla Tape a lot smaller than this, and you can even get these smaller wraps. You don't have to get you know something as big as this, but you can get some small, even at your local uh, hardware store, you can pick these up. A Bic lighter. You don't have to use this container. I've got it in, obviously, but just a simple lighter, uh, pretty dummy proof. A compass, and I would say cash, but uh, you're probably not going to be giving that out to family members, right? And then lastly, an Nalgene bottle. I like Nalgene simply because uh, I've used them. As you can see, this is pretty beat up, and it could serve a lot of practical purposes. I always like to give things away that if somebody had a kit, uh, has a kit that you give them, and they look inside, and they're like, hey, yeah, I could actually use some of the some of these items. Uh, it would be there for them. So would you recommend the same items or are there different items I didn't cover? Let us know in the comments section below. I'll post a link to all these items in the description section if you want to pick them up. And as always, stay safe out there.